Hi everybody, good morning and a very warm welcome to the SME Club by Pro Manchester, very proudly sponsored by us at Virgin Money. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name's Ruby and I'm usually running these events in our Market Street store in Manchester. But as we all continue to work from home, it's great that we can still connect with you virtually through these events. Our priority through the COVID crisis is making sure that the support is there for our customers and all the support that we offer is found on our website, which we'll make sure is circulated to you following this event. We'd love to know what you hear think of today's discussion, so do tag us in any of your social posts. We're at Virgin Money on all social platforms. And today's topic, we're talking to the property industry experts. So I'll hand over to Chris to get things started. Thank you very much, Ruby, and thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I think we'll have a really interesting discussion, um, focusing particularly on housing um, in, across Greater Manchester, from the city centre to the towns and suburbs beyond. Um, so I'm really pleased that today we're being joined by three brilliant guests, and I hope we'll have a really good conversation. Um, starting off with, we've got Judy Noah, who is Head of Development at One Manchester. We've got Chris Roberts, who's the Business Development Manager at Rendell & Rittner. And finally, we've got Richard Knight joining us, who is Director of Land and Communities at Peel Land and Property. So I think we've got a really interesting cross section there of, of people involved in the property industry, particularly in housing and homes and where people are living. I think one thing that really has, has been quite visible during the COVID crisis is how much time we've all had to spend in our homes and how important finding the right home for for our situation, for our families, for our, where we're living at the moment is is so important to everyone. Um, and we always say a, an Englishman's home in his ca is his castle. I think that's certainly the case now um, with people looking at new home, looking at possibly moving. I, I know a few friends who have deliberately seen now as the opportunity to want to move, whether it's um, going into city centres from travelling from London, deciding they want to leave the capital and move up north, or it's families who want to have more space and look at bigger opportunities. So we're going to kick start our conversation today with possibly the most broadest question you could possibly ask when talking to you. I'm very sorry I'm going to go to you first on this and I, please don't hate me for it. But Judy, I was going to ask what do you see as the immediate challenges in tackling the housing crisis at the moment? And I think fr from your perspective, particularly coming from a um, a housing association in the city. What do you see as being the, the, the key issues that need to be addressed to help with the housing crisis? Um, thank you. So, um, yeah, we, I work for One Manchester as a housing association. We've got twelve and a half thousand um, homes that we manage in, in the city. And I guess it's fair to say that a lot of our residents um, are on the more vulnerable um, side of the um, population to certainly economically um, and probably less well catered for by mainstream developers perhaps so we have sort of our sort of major concern I guess in terms of tackling the housing crisis is around affordability and accessibility to uh, homes in the city centre um, we've got um, you know a, a customer base that are most vulnerable, I would I would suspect, to some of the sort of economic uncertainties that we might be facing over the next sort of couple of years or few years. We don't really know yet how long that might be. Um, so most vulnerable in terms of job loss, uh, reduced income, um, and just generally most vulnerable in terms of accessibility to the housing market. So for me, it's about um, how do we continue to bring forward um, land, land supplies, housing supplies for our sector. Um, that's always a challenge. It's, it, you know, I don't think that's um, something that's related to COVID or the current lockdown. Um, you know, it's always been a challenge for us in the city. Um, and I think, you know, that's the big question for me. How do we bring forward land? How do we find those opportunities? Um, and how do we ensure that they're affordable? In terms of affordable home ownership, we also sort of offer shared ownership as a product. And I think that's one of my, my concerns. We're keeping a close eye, I guess, on the mortgage market, the shared ownership mortgage market is um, probably on the edges of the main mortgage market again, but it's a really valuable product for us. You know, it really helps enable some of our sort of customers to step from rented into home ownership. And I, I, I believe that's still a strong desire for, for a lot of people. 
Um, so we're sort of concerned to make sure that the mortgage market is still there for our customers and you know do everything we can to support our customers um, through a period of uncertainty. No, oh, thank you, Julie. Before I go to, to Richard and Chris, actually, I forgot to mention at the start, obviously, we always we always have our Q&A um, as part of this as well. So please feel free um, for those of you who are watching. If you have any questions, please, please ask them through the question. Excuse me, it's, still, it's early on a Friday, I'm not having a coffee yet. Um, please ask them through the question and answer function on the on your screen um, and we will do our best to try and answer them. Um, so Richard, if I could turn to you now around the housing crisis, I think um, Judy mentioned then about needing to bring forward land supply, particularly for developers, and, and obviously yourselves are um, a very a strong and good developer for, for Manchester and beyond, um, certainly across the northwest. What do you see that as a, a fundamental part of solving the housing crisis? And are there any any other thoughts that you've got on it? Yeah, thanks, Chris, and uh, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, our uh, view on on this is you, you've got. Um, you know, a, a huge uh, sort of concentration of, of land supply uh, that's kind of driving the, the current uh, supply of, of housing in, in Greater Manchester. So there's, there's loads happening around the city centre, high density apartments. Uh, there's quite a bit happening, um, uh, beginning to happen around town centres. Uh, and we're now seeing uh, with the emerging spatial framework and uh, you know, other things that are happening, um, you know, other land sources of land supply starting to come forward. So I think, you know, the, the, the wider Greater Manchester does need all those sources of land supply to meet the, the demands across uh, the area. Uh, so from the sort of super high density in the city centre uh, out through to suburban development. And I think what one of the thing, one of the challenges facing everybody is uh, how we kind of build up the, the maybe the miss, slightly missing bit in the middle uh, of the medium density development. Uh, so we've got lots of sort of suburban uh, housing coming. Uh, there's lots of very high density, uh, but how we maybe you know build uh, in and around the towns um, in that uh, sort of area that the government's trying to push for really. Uh, so I think that the, the, the land supply is is one. Uh, major issue and then uh, you've probably got um, you know issues around that of uh, over concentrated demand you know is there enough demand in geographically small areas to support the level of development that's coming uh, particularly with a, a you know a changing dynamic around the city centre um, and you know is there the finance to actually uh, support development in new market areas you know the more secondary locations in, in greater manchester uh, where you know it costs it can cost a lot to develop um but uh, are the values there to support that and what sort of subsidy uh, is going to be available to help mute myself there for a moment uh, thank you Richard that's re that's really interesting help and I, I think it's something I'd like to come back to actually is looking at the town centres and the, the wider Greater Manchester area in regards to looking at housing but before I do that um, Chris um, obviously with yourselves uh, you, you uh, deliver um, housing on the rental market particularly uh, with some very um, uh, well well-known sites in, in city centre um, how do you see from a rental perspective in terms of tackling the housing crisis? What, what do you see as, as what's happening at the moment and, and what are the immediate challenges for people? I think affordability is key. I mean, one of the things um, that we, so we offer, we manage over 70,000 apartments across the country, um, you know, over 8,000 in the in the northwest. And I think what we see in particular is that um, from the consultancy that we do with a lot of developers, they they just want access to to funding and then also land so it's as as richard and judy have, have both really well said it's it's the fact that you know councils need to um to work to unlock parcels of land um and you know there's there's a lot out there that, that and a lot more that can be done on that um but secondly developers need funding and wherever that comes from whether it be um you know private funding or um, or more institutional funding um, many of the developers I'm speaking with, I had a couple of meetings yesterday where cha they're changing from a buy to let model where they'd sell to more to um, you know, private individuals 
um, and they're switching their business model more to focus on uh, on build to rent. So, you know, that um, large institutional investor, they're really attracted by, um, you know, the, the long and stable uh, rental income that you can get from from housing in and around, you know, the Northwest um, and Greater Manchester in particular. Um, and I think there's going to be a stage where there's not going to be anything for them to buy if we don't keep, you know, revenue funding coming along. So um, I think that those are those are things. And going back to what Richard said as well, it's, <clears throat> it's really interesting. I think it's 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 really one that can be built on is the, and this is not to dumb them down, but the satellite towns in and around the city. I think we're so well connected with the likes of the tram and the rail network. Um, and, you know, we've seen the growth of places like Monton, um, you know, Stockport getting multi-billion pound investments. And I think that that's, that's key to kind of keep that going um, and really invest into areas because not everyone wants to live in the city centre. I think sometimes people, especially in, in the property world, can forget that. And so it's making sure that wherever people want to live is as, as good as it can be. Um, and so on, on that as well, again, funding is the access to mortgages and making sure that the lending market doesn't take too much of a dip. Um, you know, Nationwide coming back with their 10% uh, deposits on Monday for first time buyers. I think that's the right step and it's it's probably just a sign that the mortgage market's coming back um, and that needs to continue in order for people to, if, they, if they're wanting to, uh, to buy, to get on that property ladder, maybe for the first or second time. And then from a rental perspective, if people start moving around more, then it frees up different types of properties for people who want to rent. Mm -hmm. Now, that, 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 that's interesting, Chris, particularly what you're saying about people wanting to live across the conurbation now. I think we all like to moan, me, well, me particularly, I love to have a moan about the trains coming because I, I live in Bolton. I love to, to moan about the trains from Bolton into Manchester and how unreliable they can be at times. But when we actually look at what we have here in Greater Manchester, we do have a very good network in terms of that from rail um, and buses. And it's something that I think we are, I'm certainly seeing people looking at all areas of Greater Manchester um, to want to live in. And the city centre isn't, isn't obviously just the, the high rises of, of immediately around Dean's Gate and, and so on. And um, there's far more of it. I mean, obviously, Judy, your areas that you cover for One Manchester, it's not just the city centre. Um, you, you cover quite a, a wide area um, in, across Manchester. And, and I suppose with that, you see quite a a difference when it comes to the type of housing that there is and um, is, is that is that something you're seeing greater demand of from from your customers at, from one manchester i i wouldn't say i've noticed a particular change now i think it'll be a bit more gradual but what i would say is and i think richard made the point as well is that you know we have we find it very difficult to provide new good quality um low density housing so you know homes for people with gardens and families so there's a lot of pressure on um, our sector, I think, to to put um, to offer houses that are perhaps not as suitable as they should be to people. And that's mm -hmm. that's not to say that there can't be really well designed, really livable, really well connected apartment schemes, because there are. And there's lots of examples of that in the city centre, I think. But but equally, I think there is an underlying desire for people to have that bit of um, space and and bit of um, ability to to get out and family housing basically, we mm. deliver family housing new build. But I do you know I think it's one of our main challenges. There's a lot of pressure on to get density on all the sites that we look at, um, and that's not necessarily always for the best for our customers and for, and for you know for our communities um so whether that that change is coming through just yet i'm not sure that it is i think it but i think there is that underlying sort of um expectation and future demand really for um a better quality sort of type of accommodation yeah i mean picking up on on better quality accommodation do we, i mean I'll, I'll come back to you first chris um, do you have you seen or are you hearing that there is greater demand for more space from people looking at, at housing? I mean, Judy mentioned there that the, the need for some some open, some open space, a garden, or, or somewhere for people to go to, and particularly with when we had lockdown at its absolute strongest, um, mm -hmm. are we now seeing a change from people who? Previously, may have been very happy with uh, an apartment in the city centre because they had um, all the, well, the space in the city centre to explore. There was the shops, there was entertainment. There's so, so much happening, 
but now are people reassessing what their requirements are for a home and is actually having more open or accessible open space or perhaps um, areas where they can get some fresh air whether it be a, a large balcony or some open space from in an apartment or people saying no wherever I live I need to have somewhere I can stretch my legs is that something that you've seen at all? 100% um, I think that um, from the professional market in particular we're seeing that people who um, you know our, our customers who've who've been um, renting and sharing now want to move into um, say a one bedroom apartment or just to, to be by themselves because they need the space to work and concentrate mm -hmm. um, but also that the um, we're, we're seeing in particular couples moving from one bedrooms into two bedroom apartments because then they have this, the space in that second bedroom to work from home um, you're right in terms of, of when lockdown ended I don't think it's ever been more key that people have re-evaluated re where they live and why they live there um, I've got friends who who live in apartments or houses that don't have any kind of open space and so lockdown then was pretty hellish and so the first thing that they've done as soon as they can is reevaluate and then look to move mm. um you know throughout our uh, our seven btr uh, so build to rent schemes around the country the first movement that we saw bear in mind that they were 98 and 99 percent uh, rented was the only reason people were leaving is because they didn't need to be closer to their offices anymore because they could flexible work they they needed probably for mo mostly for their own mental health you know some space that was their own and maybe where they were living they lived there because as you say the city center was on their doorstep and they could get out and and you know go to the theater go to restaurants go to bars that was all taken away um so i think that's been really key um so yeah i think that the there's a work-life balance um which has really changed and people have really re-evaluated where they live why they live there um and and that that has caused a shift in um in the market that we're seeing um but then there are other people who are wanting you know the, the city center is always going to be attractive for people to to live there so that's never going to go away it's always going to be a very densely populated area but for people who have have needed to live somewhere for obviously mainly for, for work reasons um now that flexible working and working from home is much more common accepted and encouraged they're deciding that they don't need to be you know on a train for an hour every day to get into work uh, and then uh, you know in the evening they can work from home and just be as effective and, and happier not being in uh, in a densely populated area yeah absolutely uh, Richard in terms of uh, Peel Land and Property and um, the houses that you're looking to build at the moment are you have you um, looked at the demand for greater space or greater quality of home as something that's been a real attractive thing for your potential customers and people who want to buy homes at the moment? Yeah, well, we um, have just launched, uh, well, just uh, we set up 18 months ago our own house building company uh, to build out on, on, on our site. Um, and uh, we, we've designed a product from scratch that we think is actually uh, tapping into you know, maybe a bit of a gap in the market for uh, people who want the sort of the convenience and the flexibility of what an apartment might give them uh, but actually with more of the uh, the other things that we've been discussing so uh, those uh, the properties that we've we've designed uh, this is the North Stone uh, which is the, the house building company um, that they've got uh, the high-speed broadband built in, uh, efficient, uh, low-energy design, uh, flexible uh, sort of living space with uh, home office working and, and the ability to configure the, the properties. So, um, yeah, and, and externally, green space, manual for streets. So we, we think uh, there's huge demand for that type of uh, property. And then when you look at where though where we where we're delivering it out in uh, and around the, the town centres of Greater Manchester, there will be um, a, some, a, a change and a, a hopefully a renaissance of those town centres as they move from uh, retail to sort of mixed use community hubs within walking distance of, of where people live and, and with parks uh, and, and canals and uh, what have you. Uh, connecting those places together so uh, I think it potentially is quite an exciting time uh, for 
um, you know, the renaissance of the suburbs and the town centres, um, you know, and, and that's probably going to be a little bit accelerated by uh, the COVID situation. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Sorry, Julie, jump, jump in there. Well, I was just going to say, and, and I think, you know, some of those connections around schools and education and leisure, you know, um, you know, are really important too, aren't they? As part of that, it sounds really exciting. And we, we have the context. I think it's really significant that the, you know, the new new strategic direct director for growth and development at the City Council um, is clearly, um, I don't know if you saw her article in uh, Place Northwest the other, the other day, but clearly it's going to be encouraging that sort of emphasis on urban design and greening and, uh, you know, public realm. And, and I think that's significant for us. I think, you know, that livable, livable communities, livable cities and, you know, are so important for the future. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, just a quick reminder, everyone watching, please feel free to, to submit any questions you have to the panel. Um, I'm sure they don't mind any tra challenging questions or less challenging. Feel free to throw them in. Uh, but no, just picking up on that, Judy, actually, it's one of the things that I've discussed with um, a number of colleagues, particularly those of us who who do live outside the city centre and commute in, whether it is from the outskirts of the city centre, whether it's Withenshaw or Altringham or Bolton, Wigan but, or Bury, um, is I, I do wonder whether the the, the less commuting we are going to do, which has its knock on effect, particularly around air pollution, which we've seen that the records around air pollution in the city centre have, have been remarkable. I mean, from my home here in Bolton, um, I've got a, a view of the city centre and more days than less, I've been actually able to see the city centre from from my upstairs window because the air has been that clear. It's been remarkable. Um, but one of the other things that I think has been talked about is as it's possible that those of us who do work in office jobs in the city centre are not expected to come in Monday to Friday anymore. We are, it's it's looking more likely that it'll be two, three days a week. You'd, you'd be in the city and the other times you'd be working from home and that need for a home office. But as we commute less and we focus more on our communities, are, are we going to see to that stronger community feel i think because you were picking up there Julie, about the the connections to our schools and and um le local leisure leisure that we need and similarly richard what you were saying about the suburbs having a bit of renaissance from it um certainly i've seen more people using our local grocers at the end of the road and our local bakers at the end of the road do we think that one of the knock-on effects of lockdown and how we've we're going to change how we live and work will be stronger communities and stronger community hubs for people because we are going to end up spending a lot more time in them. Is that something you think, Judy, at all? I really hope so and I think so. Um, I'm just sort of trying to think about that. I mean, I, I think one of the, it's really important that the sort of the, the transport is um, addressed and thought about as part of that question. Um, and I suppose the worst case scenario is that, you know, that we gradually all just sort of drift back into getting in the car and going into the city centre, isn't it? Or, or sort of on jumping on the tram, I guess. So I don't know that I have an answer to that, but I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it sort of feels that it would fit. Um, so I don't know, maybe the others have got a, 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 an opinion on that. What, what do you think, Chris? Because uh, I mean, certainly I know that a lot of the um, schemes that have been built for uh, built to rent have been designed to create a community feel within the buildings. Um, do you see a, a greater emphasis on community within um, smaller areas, potentially like, for example, in the city centre, the sense of community around the northern quarter where we've seen the pedestrianisation of large areas to help support the restaurants and bar trade. Do, do, do you think there's, a, there's actually a good opportunity here to see us build to, to be better and closer neighbours with one another? I think definitely. I mean, one thing that um, like I think everyone saw is that when as soon as you're locked down and can't go anywhere, you know, that, that social isolation can kick in pretty quickly. And I think since the um, lockdown has lifted and you've seen things like the, you know, uh, Thomas Street in the Northern Court, Stevenson Square being uh, pedestrianised and it's been almost like, you know, a piazza in, in you know, the Mediterranean somewhere, albeit not with the weather. Um, it has been brilliant to see, you know, I think there's been a real community spirit. There's been a lot of, um, you know, people wanting to support their local businesses. 
um, mm. and especially their independence, which I think is key because, you know, I mean, so I live in a, a small village south of uh, of Warrington and the first thing people were asking wasn't if um, the Costa was opening, it was when the small independent coffee shop was opening because they wanted to support them. You know, there were, there were queues, you know, 200 metres long to kind of support them um, and that was pretty constant when they did open. Um, so I think that that is key and I think that that the virtual community which we saw, you know, there's there's been so many Facebook groups set up in my area for people buying and selling things or, you know, wanting to do different quizzes in, in different events. Um, people have really kind of started to reach out and as uh, as Judy said, I hope that we don't go back to the days where you just jump in your car, drive to where you need to go, get out of your car, go to the office, come back and don't really get too much interaction. Um, I think it, it will change, will change for the better and, and as you say, it will create areas with, you know, if if people are staying in the same area for longer um, because they're working around there, they'll expect similar types of things that they do in the city centres in terms of a really good coffee shop, you know, really good clothes shops or, you know, charity shops or whatever it is. So there's a real economic opportunity there, um, which I think could really benefit, especially if they become hubs for people to, you know, to meet and socialise and, and kind of build that sense of community. Oh, absolutely. Um, we've 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 had a, a question come in from one of the people watching. Thank you very much. And um, anyone else, please get your questions in from John. Um, and this is a, a bit of a tough one. I think it's a it's an interesting one to look at because I think there's a lot of demand now for people to see change. We've we've lived through a quite a considerable crisis, and we've seen how our environments improved. We we are seeing examples like you've just been talking about, Chris, there about people living in their communities more wanting to support local business and people want to see change now. So John's asking uh, property development and infrastructure projects take time. How quickly can we expect to see some of the changes that the panel have been highlighting? So how realistic is it that we can actually carry some of these things forward quite quickly? Um, Richard, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go at that one, Chris. I mean, uh, yeah, d development always has a lead in time. Um, you know, planning can take time, uh, site remediation. Uh, so, yeah, you, you are looking at years uh, for, for some of these things to, to happen. Um, but we are trying to build communities for uh, the next 50, 100 years with some of these developments. So, you know, they need to be done uh, right and take time. Um, and there's no reason why we can't start, start them quickly. Uh, you know, if, if, if planning is uh, sp sped up a little bit, I mean, everybody uh, has come across a, a planning situation that, that takes a bit too long. Um, but the other um, side of this, which, which is the subject of big government push at the moment, is uh, converting buildings and, and spaces. Um, so there's a lot of uh, press, particularly in, in around planning press, uh, about permitted development rights and converting potentially offices to residential or, you know, more flexible uses of buildings. There's a big concern about uh, the, the quality of that and, and how you control it, but potentially you could see, uh, you know, new communities and new things actually starting to pop up, um, particularly if there are, you know, office parks or, you know, places that actually do need to uh, transition fairly quickly. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that there's there's going to be a very fluid situation as I see it for, for the next uh, couple of years whilst lots of things are tried and understood and we begin to see how this is all going to pan out. Yeah, now, that's that's really interesting Richard and I'd follow that up with a, a further question if you if you don't mind about um, the environment and, and certainly the, the desire to see zero carbon um, in terms of our, our homes and wanting to look at that. Um, I mean, do you think that it is possible for us to, to have zero carbon homes or are we going to be looking at realistically in the short term homes that reduce their carbon footprint rather than it being completely zero carbon? And actually, do people want those? Are those things that people are asking for out there at the moment? I think people do want it um, and I think it's right to have an ambitious policy. Uh, I know Greater Manchester is pushing for a policy beyond um, the, the national uh, sort of timescale for achieving this. Um, but obviously getting there needs to be achieved in, in manageable steps. So 
um, you know, we, we're building uh, above uh, building regs and uh, BREAM levels, um, but we're not zero carbon yet. Uh, some of our developments can be zero carbon ready. Uh, we, we're committing to that through some of the logistics schemes. Um, but yeah, I think uh, customers, both uh, individuals, you know, private purchasers and also uh, corporates, that they are looking for that as part of their sustainability view. Uh, mm. So it, it will come. The, the, the difficulty is, is cost and you know, it's not just the buildings uh, and, and the cost of achieving zero carbon buildings, but we're also looking at uh, things like biodiversity net gain and natural capital and, and how you can actually achieve an overall uh, net gain position for the, the, the planet, if you like, through, through development and that the costs of that just, just add to uh, the already significant costs of development. So um, how, how you know, unless we're going to push prices up and, and achieve values at a time when the economy is going to be struggling, uh, it's going to be sort of difficult. So uh, what the government does and, you know, the, what the combined, how much the combined authority kind of prioritise this, it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, Judy, I can see you jumping at the bit to tell us about one Manchester's <laughs> plans for zero carbon homes. And so, what are you, what are you doing at the moment? What are you looking at in terms of zero carbon and carbon reduction? Oh, I mean, I just to say first, I completely agree with what Richard just said in terms of you know where we should be heading and the the roadmap, if you like, to get towards um, zero carbon or very low carbon. Um, and where we are at the moment at One Manchester is we have some schemes that are on site. We have a completed scheme and, and we have two on site that will meet um, very low carbon, but we've not taken the step for them to be completely zero carbon. So our general standard is sort of low carbon and a bit more, perhaps the sort of going beyond the 2020 um, partels that getting the fabric up there a bit further. But we do have some schemes where we're going be beyond that and we're, we're getting into sort of um, fabric first passive house type levels of fabric efficiency combined with air source heat pumps, which gets you to very low carbon and it gets you to very low carbon with um, um, very low um, energy bills as well, which is the, the for me, the third factor that we always look at when we're looking at carbon, we're looking at cap balancing capital cost, carbon benefits and energy costs. And if you're not careful, you can do the some, some of you can go part way and find that actually energy costs are, 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 are the sort of the loser, because if you start to rely on electricity at the moment, um, you know, that that's high cost to the resident. So we're going as far as we think is sensible at the moment with one or two schemes so that we know what it would take to get those from very low carbon to zero carbon. And I think, um, you know, Richard used the, the term sort of, well, something like zero carbon ready, isn't it? Sort of being able to sort of take that next step, but not necessarily doing it now. But I just feel that we all need to be on that on that roadmap. We all need to be sort of work, working through the issues um, because there is a cost to it and the reason we've not gone completely to zero carbon just yet is that you know you've got to balance what what the future might bring there will be a lot of technological changes I think over the next 10 15 years as you know if you go into it there's so much talk about you know obviously the whether the grid will become sort of it's getting more and more renewable uh, decarbonisation of gas is on the agenda isn't it um, you've got you know what might happen with battery technology so there's lots of changes that for me make it sensible to go so far, but not necessarily get try and get right there just yet. And whilst it's not far away in development terms, I think we we've got a bit of time to do that sort of research and analysis and and get on that on that journey. Um, but accepting that there is a cost to it, you know, inevitably there's going to be a cost to it. Um, and I agree with what Richard said about that. It, you know, that's a cost that adds to what's already often quite a quite a difficult, um, you know, financial scenario to make it balance. Um, so I think, yeah, I, th I think it's about carbon culture and I sort of equate it and, you know, I sort of think about it a bit like the building safety culture that we're being sort of all required to think about you know the sort of the fire safety building safety and, and reforms in that sense i think it's about carbon culture for organizations as well 
Yeah, oh, that's really interesting, Julie. Thank you, Chris. Is is, is um, low carbon living uh, or zero carbon hope something that you're seeing from your sector at all? Are you seeing people looking more at one of their requirements for a home to be um, particularly good for the environment? Is that something that's been a, a high priority for people at the moment? Um, well, as a business, it is for us anyway. Um, you know, we're we're extremely keen on being as sustainable as possible. So, for example, uh, we work with a company called Ecotricity. Um, so, where we can place um, electricity for our clients, um, we we place it through them because we are able to get the best cost with our procurement. Um, at, you know, the size of of the business that we are, um, but also, it all comes from re renewable sources. So, it saves. You know some of our clients a lot of money but also it you know one of our larger clients it's it stopped 330 tons of uh, of co2 going into the atmosphere which is uh, the equivalent of 110 elephants um so you know there's there's some real um savings to be achieved but also you know carbon savings not just financial um so we've got a different take on it as well because obviously we do our building consultancy so there's a real push for it and uh, as richard and judy have also said there's you know a real demand um on buildings to be as you know as, as carbon neutral as possible if not carbon zero um cost is always an issue but also on the fact that you know we we work on a lot of buildings that have been built for 10 15 20 25 years so the people who live in in those and instructors they want to be as um as efficient as possible you know richie sunak announced that people were going to have grants for their homes to make them as you know as green as possible just because people live in in apartment buildings you know they want the same thing so uh, we've worked with a lot of our clients but it's it's as judy said it's about the cost and benefit analysis of it you know it's trying to get everyone on the same page who lives in a, in a particular building to you know to want to spend more money on you know making where they they live greener for some people it's a priority and it's a culture thing as judy rightly said for other people it's just not a priority and they don't want to be spending the money so um it's a real initiative that you know we we try our best to you know to guide our our, our clients and our customers as to you know what makes sense for them in terms of you know being being greener and, and you know investing in things like controllable LED lights, which can save astronomic amounts in, in terms of electricity. But there is a cost associated to that. So whether the cost benefit analysis pays off um, for the people that, that live there who are, you know, who pay our pay our fees and pay our bills. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming in now through the Q&A. And um, so I'm going to jump over to those. Um, so please do if, if you have a burning question you want to ask anyone on the panel, please submit them now um, and I'll try my best to try and get them in. If, if there is anything you want to ask specifically to one of the panellists, please put it through. Um, I'm sure they'll do the best to answer now, but if we can't, get in touch um, with your details and we'll make sure an answer gets back to you another way. But to start off with, it's a question to everybody, um, but it refers to what you mentioned, Judy, at the start. And this is from Hayley. Uh, and she says, Judy mentioned at the beginning of the session um, of how accessibility and affordability for housing is important. What steps are being taken to ensure that these new communities and developments will be accessible and affordable for local residents and first time buyers? So I'll, I'll throw that to all of you, but Judy, as the instigator of talking about affordability, would you like to take a first stab at that? Um, so I think there's the sort of the, the the current here and now answer to that, but there's also I think a long term answer to that. And I think you know for me that question is in the heart is is at the heart of that question about sustainability. Um, so you know long term it's in everybody's interest I think to make sure that homes are accessible and affordable because that's what will will drive you know more and more sort of demand and more and more sort of people to be able to sort of live in whether it's city centres or, or local hubs. In terms of sort of the reality of here and now, obviously from one Manchester's point of view, we we develop we are developing ourselves um, affordable housing, um, and we are working in partnership with developers to ensure that you know that we can sort of um, you know deliver afford more affordable housing through some of the sort of work that developers um, you know such as such as Richard's company. Um, are delivering themselves so we will work in partnership to make sure that you know that as much as possible is delivered as accessible and affordable and we will deliver directly ourselves but 
you know, coming back to the constraints, you know, that that's in the context of, you know, um, you know, housing crisis. So we know that there's ne there's a need for more and more. Um, I don't know if that answers the questions question very well, but I think it's the reality of you know of what we're trying to do. Yeah, Richard, what's uh, your um, position on that in terms of uh, affordability and for local community the first time buyers? Yeah, I mean, when, when you go to the root cause of this, uh, you probably know what I'm going to say here, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, we've not built enough homes in this country for decades. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're probably several million homes short um, and we don't really uh, have a plan to sort that out. Uh, I know the government keeps saying that, that they're going to, but uh, you know, we, we yet to really see that. So, um, you know, that's the, that's the, the big long term answer. Uh, to that question. Uh, you can only really make homes affordable uh, by uh, sorting that out. I think um, you know, obviously at the moment we've got a situation uh, where the, the, there are a lot of quite active and well resourced uh, uh, housing associations like Judy's and, and several others who are getting a lot more active in the market which is great and they are filling uh, well, they are adding to what the traditional house builders and the, the new entry uh, SMEs and, and others are doing. So the, the industry can grow its output uh, through the RPs. Um, and I know some councils are, what are wanting to sort of get on with building as well. Um, but I think a lot of it does come back to the land question um, because, uh, you know, if, if the sites are available to build on, then you get a win-win because you, you not only do you build the market housing that help, helps temper price growth, but you can also then secure uh, various forms of affordable housing. You know, typically on most of our uh, schemes, we'll be at you know, 10, 15 percent upwards towards 30, 35 percent affordable, uh, depending on viability uh, and what the policy is in that area. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, I think that there is a, a political um, you know, challenge in there for the government as to how serious they are actually in, in tackling this. Uh, I would say primarily about land, but also about the, the resources and the finance that they then put into delivering that. Mm -hmm. no, thank you, Richard. Chris, uh, more about yourself in regards to affordability for, for communities, and particularly those in the local communities who, who want to stay living in those areas. What's your, your thoughts? I mean, I think um, you know Richard just said it as better than than I ever could. It's it comes down to that we we're building tens of thousands too few um, properties every single year. So you know if there was enough property, then there would be the you know the, there is the demand there, and it would mean that they would be more affordable. I think what's going to be interesting is to see how you know this next generation coming through, it, they might not have the same um, ideals as for example, you know, me in my late 30s uh, does in terms of, you know, wanting to own a house. You know, um, I've got colleagues and friends who are in their early 20s and they've got absolutely no wish whatsoever to be tied down to a house. Um, you know, they want to rent and they want to rent exactly where they want and have the freedom and flexibility. So is there an argument that as um, there are more options in you know in the property sector it becomes more space as a service and therefore you know renting will will therefore free up you know more homes in, and especially in you know in, in localities as you mentioned for you know for people to buy but again it comes down to funding for developers and then you know the affordability of of you know and the price of money for um you know for individuals and and couples and families that want to get on them on the property market yeah absolutely I there, uh, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we have our shared ownership sort of programme and and I would say that there is a lot of evidence that still that a lot of people do want to buy. Uh, uh, you know, I know that that's not necessarily everybody, uh, but what we're finding is that the age that people are buying at is get, getting older and a lot of our first time buyers in shared ownership are into their late 30s and into their 40s and their first time buyers. So I do wonder whether it's something around you know where you are personally age-wise it's also something around you know how whether you can physically access mm. um ownership um so I, you know i'm 
I know that there's been a move away from ownership. I suppose what I'm saying is, is that a choice or is that or is that a result of other factors um, long term? No, that's that's really interesting one, Judy, certainly in terms of the, the changing dynamics of the housing market and the the profile of a, a house, someone who wants to buy a house, I think certainly has changed dramatically. And I think that also feeds into the issue of affordability, like you're saying, how people are they're having to be older because they're needing to build up that equity to be able to buy it with a deposit to buy a house in the first place. So there is that changing. And similarly, Chris, I, I know many people um, in my um, social circle who don't want to buy because, well, most of all, they don't know where they're going to be working in the next few years. Um, they've moved from not just different parts of cities to for work, but they're moving in between cities every few years. And there's certainly a need for them to have that flexibility. And the the, the way that we are working now, how we're working more remotely and the, the fact that working remotely is allowing someone who to live in the north and yet work in London quite easily. I think there is going to be more dynamic changes along that front as well. So that's really that's fascinating. We've had more questions come in, um, and these are actually um, I'll, I'll go through the ones that have been specifically asked of members of the panel. Um, so Chris, if I'm going to you first, you've had a couple of questions come in um, from someone called Anonymous. I don't know who that is, sadly. That's me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Let you hand over the brown envelope later, but wait until you hear the questions. You may not like them. Yeah. So to start off with. So Anonymous asked a couple of questions of you. Uh, a question to Chris, how has the face of PRS design changed in your conversation with developers? Um, and that's the second question. Has your pipeline been affected during COVID? And um, is it now, ease, how is it going easing out of COVID? Have you seen a change? Um, so to answer the first one, um, I think, and again, go, going back to the first question that was asked by, by John, um, you know, the the changes that developers want to see in their buildings are happening now. We're redesigning and, and you know, doing um, consultancy for developers who want to completely change their schemes in the wake of, of lockdown and COVID and, and what that now means for their um, developments. They understand that, you know, a balcony is now more desirable than maybe, you know, some more inner space, but also saying that just bigger apartments in general, you know, to have um, you know, some space where you can have a desk and a, you know, your laptop and, and do work, but then, you know, shut that down at the end of the day. And I think it's really important from a mental side, of, you know, point of view to kind of you know, almost like lock it away for the day, um, you know, once you've finished and then live, you know, mm -hmm. I've never had a, sh a shorter commute in my life. Um, and I think that it's important to be able to, you know, almost partition works only a certain amount of what you do and it shouldn't define you. So um, there's definitely been a, a step change there. Um, and also particularly in terms of the communal spaces and how they're used and the flexibility. We always advise developers to be flexible with um, with communal space and amenity space because, you know, sometimes developers have designed things into their buildings that they think are needed. And it turns out that there's something completely different to needed, like a crash, for example. Um, so we're seeing a lot of the change in that point of view. In terms of pipeline, um, so we've taken on um, a couple of thousand apartments since the beginning of March, so been relatively unaffected in that in that point of view, um, which is a positive. Um, and our pipeline for BTR, uh, we are um, we've got a pipeline of it's eight developments at the moment. So again, it's that's pretty strong, um, and I think that there'll, there'll be more. Um, consultancy and more development consultancy coming just on the, in on the back of things that we've you know we've been doing in the past uh, six months. Great, thanks, Chris. Judy, a question for you. Um, this is again from anonymous, very popular anonymous today, <laughs> wanting to ask questions. Um, is there an appetite for one Manchester to rent houses from private landlords? Um. We are involved sometimes in renting properties from private landlords. Um, so yes, I'm not sure that it's something that is at the heart of our pipeline, if you like. Um, it's more about specific needs. Um, so it comes into play sometimes when we're looking at sort of perhaps more along the 
um, supported lines um, where we're sort of looking for specific properties in, in certain areas. Uh, we've purchased off private landlords, um, so we've taken, um, you know, we've taken sort of stock from private landlords to manage ourselves and we manage um, a number of properties on long leases, um, you know, from different owners, but they're, they're long leases rather than sort of short term leases. So, I mean, yes, uh, yeah, yes, we, we are interested in that. It's part of what, what we do. Um, it's not part of our sort of major pipeline, though. Our major pipeline is refurbishment of either sort of uh, existing buildings and new build. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Like, last couple of questions. Richard, I'll, I'll throw this one at you. Um, Anonymous again uh, has asked another question. How do you see house prices, prices changing over the next 12 months? particularly properties at the lower end of the property markets? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes uh, back to some of the points that Judy made about ability to afford and, you know, where, where are we going to be with uh, unemployment, uh, mortgage uh, availability, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, potentially uh, we might see um, some stagnation uh, we might see, uh, you know, it all depends on the economy, doesn't it? And, and how bad and if, if there is a second wave, uh, what's that going to do uh, to people's ability uh, to pay? So um, when you look at the lower end of the market, that is where the impact of COVID is more keenly felt, um, particularly younger people and less skilled people. So, um, you know, they, they uh, may be more impacted. And, and that for me is where you know, some of the government uh, focus needs to be really uh, in the housing market uh, to, to try and sort of offset uh, some of that impact. Great. Thank you, Richard. That, that's actually a helpful segue to our very last question, because uh, we're we've running, as always with these, we're running out of time and we could probably go on for another couple of hours. And uh, first of all, answering questions that are still coming in, uh, but also just to develop some, some of these thoughts that we're having. So my, la my last question to all of you, um, and if you don't mind, it's come from John again. And John, if you don't mind me slightly adept, adapting it for now, because we've only got a couple of minutes left. John asks, what would be the one thing that government could do that would have the biggest impact on, on the short term housing market? So I'm going to let you become prime minister for 10 seconds. What is the one thing that you would do to help the housing market right now? Richard, you just mentioned government then. What, what would be the one thing you'd do quickly? Um, well, it would be probably remiss of me to not go down the planning route with it. I mean, that, that for us, it, it would. Um, yes, there's a longer term element, but actually, you know, if, if the government wants us to sort of build, 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 then, you know, we need them to almost approve, approve, approve so <laughs> that we can start uh, investing. And, and that investment could happen could start happening quite quickly, um, mm -hmm. but there's so there's so many schemes um, uh, that have been waiting on planning uh, that you know could could be ready to go within a year or two. So um, yeah, that that would be my message. Uh, uh, approve, <laughs> approve, approve, approve. I love yeah. that, Richard. Chris, what would you, what would you do as prime minister? You've got a magic wand to to do one thing. What would it be? It, see, it's so hard to answer this question without immediately thinking about all the reasons why you couldn't do something. Um, <laughs> if, if it was inconsequential, which is obviously an ideal world, it would be to um, just get rid of stamp duty. Uh, we've seen that obviously Rishi Sunak, you know, removing it for homes up to half a million will, you know, create, um, you know, a, a market in itself and a short term boost. But, um, you know, for average property prices in London, it's it's going to do nothing for, for that market at all. You know, it's 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 not stimulating it at all. And it would change it from, you know, from both angles. So it might make the, um, you know, the market a bit more free uh, in terms of movement, not in terms of cost. Um, and but then the counter argument is, well, where does that, you know, where does that money come from? So, um, but, you know, yeah, without any consequences, it would be to remove stamp duty. Thanks, Chris. Judy, I'll let you have the last word on what government should do now. What would you do as Prime Minister? 
Um, well, I'm going to cheat and have two two connected things uh, in, in my answer. I think if we, if the housing crisis is going to need to be resolved through brownfield development, then there needs to be a real recognition of the costs and, and sort of flexibility and funding around that sort of infrastructure grant funding. And I know there's been some announcements and there is money available, but it's a, a big, um, big problem in terms of bringing forward brownfield sites, I would say. And if it isn't going to be, if that's not possible, then I think that the planning policy and taking the pressure off some of our cities around um, around some of the edges around planning policy is needed. Brilliant. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. So um, I'm afraid we've run out of time again um, today. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you, for joining me today. I've, it's been a really interesting discussion. I think we've covered a, a huge, broad range of topics there. And like I said, we could easily go on for longer. And I think if we, we want to explore this again in a few months' time, um, I'd love to have you all back on to have a further chat to see where we're lying and seeing what changes we've seen. Um, so once again, thank you very much all three of you for joining me. Thank you again Virgin Money for helping uh, sponsoring Pro Manchester for this. Thank you Pro Manchester for pulling everything together. Um, we are planning some other webinars um, for the knowledge exchange coming up over the summer. Um, I think we're going to have a little bit of a break for the next couple of weeks, but we've got a couple of things in the pipeline. Um, but please, if you're watching, if there's an area that you'd like us to discuss, um, something we haven't spoken about before, please get in touch with myself, um, at Grayling or Pro Manchester, and we're more than happy to facilitate it. So thank you once again, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.